Hey, can I get someone to read out Revelation 13, uh, verses 11 through to 18? I can, if you like. Mm -hmm. 11 to 18? Yep. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. <coughs> and he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword, and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand, or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the num or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score and six. Mm -hmm. Now, last time we looked at the, the beast from the earth um, and we identified that and, and saw the part that, that it played in these, these final events. Um, today, we're going to start looking at the image of the beast. And so the first question uh, we want to look at is what is the relationship between the beast from the earth and the image of the beast in this passage? Uh, Gaylene. Um, oh, where, where was I? <laughs> um, in verse 14, um, he's, uh, the second beast is deceiving them that dwell on the earth. And he's also saying to them that they should make an image to the beast. <clears throat> and then he had power to give life to the image of the beast that the image should speak and also cause as many that would not worship said image or the image should be killed and they're also causing a mark and you go down into obviously the mark of the beast um, but yeah he's he says to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast. And then he had power to give life unto that image. Mm -hmm. Yep. So the, the beast from the earth, its job is, is two things. Um, first, its job is to deceive the people so that they would, they would you know, make the image. And then its job is to give life to the image of the beast. So it deceives and then it gives life to the image so that the image then goes about enforcing the mark, killing those that don't worship it. And so there's this, this transition that the, the purpose of this beast from the earth is to get the people ready to deceive them and then to bring in this next power, this image of the beast. So is America going to cause miracles? Just having a look at verse 14 there. Mm -hmm. Yep. It deceives them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which she had power to do in the sight of the beast. Hmm. And um, it, it mentions the, the great wonders that it does in the previous verse, making fire came down from heaven on the earth. And 
we looked at a couple examples of that last week. Oh. Yeah. Every time that was looked at, um, you know, with, with David, with, with Solomon, with the dedication of the temple, um, it was a sign of, of God showing with divine power that these are his people with, with Elijah on Mount Carmel. Fire came down to consume and the people knew that, yes, this is God's person. This is God's prophet. And so the, the, the miracle that you know, this, this America does, or you, you, well, it, it is religious in nature. So we're looking at this religious America, would be evangelical Protestant America, um, is going to deceive the world that into believing that that God is on its side, that they need to actually build this image of the beast that can go about carrying out this religious persecution. That this is going back on everything that that country was founded for. We, we looked at. Um, spoke about having two horns like a lamb you know horns being representation of, of a power or kingdoms and christ recognized the two kingdoms of the church and state were under caesar what a caesar and under god what, what is god's and so this you know america that was founded upon the separation of church and state is going to deceive the people that dwell on the earth that they should build an image to the beast you know this is the the, the first beast that had the deadly wound and was healed. We looked at that as being the, the papal power that had its 1260 year reign of persecution where, you know, it, it not, not only was there a joining together of church and state, but the religious decrees were enforced throughout Europe and punishable by death if you spoke up against them, if you didn't worship according to the, 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 the papal um, edicts and, and what they had decided. And America, according to this prophecy, is going to deceive the people to make another beast that is like that papal power, that is the same thing that is happening there. There's going to be a union again of church and state. That America's job here is to deceive the people into believing that God is on their side. That they are so righteous that they need to take their idea of religion, their idea of worshipping the true God, and enforce that upon the world, just like the papacy did throughout the medieval ages and the dark ages. And so once America has deceived the world into doing this. And that's, that's another point. Um, it deceives them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had a wound by the sword and did live. That the image of the beast, this final persecuting power is brought in by popular consent. You know, the, the majority of people on earth will want this. And then once it's deceived them and they've brought this image of the beast, we're told there in verse 15 that he has power to give life unto the image of the beast, that it should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Now, um, Something interesting that comes, that stands out from this. If we look throughout scripture um, about what, what an image is, where is that um, word sort of most often used? If you can just cast your mind back through whatever you've read of the, the Old Testament, the New Testament. In what context does the images most often appear? Jaylene? Usually it is um, 
an image of yeah, it is an idol hmm. whether it be the golden calf whether it be um the image that nebuchadnezzar made all of gold or whether it be um carvings and stuff because there was uh one of the kings was it josiah went around and took down all the images and the pictures and god told him to take down yeah god told them to yeah when you go and take down all the pictures the images and all the rest of it and the israelites didn't do that when they went into canaan hmm. and things didn't go so well because they left them up like in the groves and but it's always to do with idolatry mm -hmm. <clears throat> Can we turn to the book of Psalms? In Psalms chapter 135. And um, there's a little passage there where it talks about the idols. Um, and there are a number of different places where it speaks of idols. And in similar words, we'll just read out this one. Psalms 135. And can someone read verses 15 to 17? The idols of the heathen are silver and gold, and the works work of man's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Neither is there any breath in their mouths. Hmm. So how is this idol, this image, described here in Psalms? If you had to sum that up. What's it saying about them? They seem to have all the attributes of a created being, whether it be human or animal. Mm -hmm. But they're not doing anything. They're quite useless. They just sit there. Mm -hmm. They don't hear. They don't see. They don't speak. They don't. They, there's. They don't even live. There's no breath. It's the idols. And now the work of men's hands, there's, <clears throat> it seems strange to make something with your own hands, with human hands, and then worship it as a God when you're the one that's made it. Hmm. Isn't there a passage somewhere that says somebody takes like a, a piece of wood chops it in half and then basically makes an idol out of one half and burns the other half mm. and it's like um, that doesn't make sense because if you've burnt the one half it's come from the same chunk of wood and you're engraving and carving and worshipping one side but yet you burnt the other that makes no sense at all mm. but there's actually this uh, apocryphal story about Abraham um, and his father. Um, the, the, the story goes that Abraham's father had a job um, as an idol maker, and Abraham was you know, arguing with him about, you know, why are you doing this? They're just dumb idols. They, they can't, you know, they can't hear, they can't see, they can't do anything. And his father's like, no, no, they're... They're gods, you need to respect them, you know, or you know, or they might, you know, curse you or whatever. And one day, why Abraham's father was out, Abraham went into the the idol, you know, shop with a hammer and smashed all of the idols, except for one. And then the one idol that was left, he took the hammer and he put it in that idol's hands. And um then his father came back and saw the shop and yelled, Abraham, what'd you do? Get in here. Why'd you break my idols? And I was like, I didn't break them. Look, clearly that, that, that idol there went around and broke them. Well, look, he's got the hammer in his hand. He's caught red-handed. 
And his father's like, don't be stupid. He can't do that. It's just a statue. And Abraham's all like, well, if he can't do anything, why are you worshipping him? Um, and it's, that's sort of just a, a somewhat comedic um, story uh, about that that illustrates that the point of these idols that, you know, like you mentioned there, that the, the foolishness of people to um, put their faith in them, to, to, to trust in them when they realize that they can't do anything. And even the word idol itself, you know, if, if you like how that word is used in our language, if a car is idling, what's it doing? It's, you know, it's running, but it's just sitting there. It's not going anywhere. It's not doing anything. If a person is being idle, they're sitting around, they're not doing anything. Because that's the definition of an idol. It's something that sits around and doesn't do anything. Mm. And that's what it highlights there in, in Psalms and Isaiah and Jeremiah. You know, throughout the scriptures, God's constantly repeating them that these idols, they can't speak, they can't act, they can't do anything. But we see something different happening here in Revelation 13. The people make this idol, okay? That they create uh, this false god to worship as part of this end time religion. But something different happens. That beast from the earth, this, this, this you know, uh, America that we looked at, this American power, the last thing it does is it actually gives life to this idol, to the image of the beast, to this, this false god, that it should both speak and act and cause as many that would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And so we have this sort of this living idol, this beast power at the end. And again, this highlights the, the idea of it's all about false worship, the, the worshiping of this idol that's being created. Kayleen. So... Does that mean then that they're actually going to create a physical object or is it more like, uh, what's the word, philosophical is what I'm looking for, um, because we can make yeah, we have sports idols. We there's a TV show called American Idol. Like it, it the name is you know it does what it says on the tin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they're pe the people. Yep. You know, yeah. Yeah. Whether it be business moguls or whether even people end up turning idols. Um, you from all walks of, of life, not necessarily people, but ideas even. They make an idol out of what they do. You know, um, things they do in their lives. So when it says that they, as in the people that dwell on the earth, make an image to the beast and then that beast is given life in what aspect of an image or an idol would we be looking at so i've, I've probably gone ahead sorry mm -hmm. no i i think that's a good point you know the the whole nature of this the book of revelation the passages these things are symbolic you know that the beast from the earth represents america it's two horns like a lamb represents you know the, the two kingdoms that christ recognized speaking like a dragon that that dragon is is the devil there's also um symbology here that's being interpreted into something literal that will happen um 
And so when it talks about, you know, them making this idol, this image, it's, it's not a, a literal statue that will be made somewhere that that's going to be the big image of the beast. Because again, that it's not going to be able to actually walk around and speak and do stuff. It's not actually talking about America giving life to a physical image. Um, it's highlighting the, the, the spiritual nature of this. This is going to be this idolatrous system that is a worship of a false god. Um, and it's going to be in the name of the God of the Bible. The people that are doing this are deceived into believing that this is the true God of the Bible. This is his will and what he wants. And they'll be killing God's people thinking they are doing God's will. That's one of the things that Jesus warned about in the Gospel of John and in his, his final discourse with his disciples. He says, you know, the day will come when they that kill you will think that they do God's service. Uh, Ralph. Yes, yeah, speaking of image to the beast, I, I think it could well be a religious system. It has all the aspects of the ecumenicism in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the state gives them the power or whatever. Mm. Something like that. Yeah. I, th I think that fits in as well. Same with the whole church state. Um, union that um was so prevalent throughout the dark ages in europe and notice as well we looked at the first beast from the sea as being the papal power that beast from the earth as being um the, the united states specifically is this this religious aspect and so you've got the the papal churches and then protestant america joining together um you know in, in the, this final image um idolatrous system and so yeah you know that whole ecumenism you, you, thing you mentioned um is all working towards this you know and these people believe that god is on their side you know that's what the beast deceived them to do but they're creating this idolatrous system of false worship um thinking that they're doing god's service and america's final part of this is it gives life to that that system to this final beast it gives it the ability to speak and to kill and to persecute that's we see the same thing happened with the papacy you know around that 508 to 538 when it was first clovis and then finally justinian where these these nations of Europe gave the the Pope the ability to declare war on her theological enemies on, on on those that didn't worship the way she wanted them to and so that beast was given power to persecute and to kill for 1260 years when the nations gave their armies to enforce its decree and so here we see the same thing this beast from the earth giving life to this um, image of the beast so that it can both speak, de declare its doctrines its will, and cause all those to die who don't worship according to its way. Uh, Gaylene. Oh, I was just going to, um, you, you basically just uh, answered it. I was going to say um, when something has the power to give life to a system, then it would be just like verse 11, you know, two horns like a lamb and he spake as a dragon. So it would be the same sort of speaking. Well, mm. the, the speaking is the same sort of um, idea that when the image speaks, it is... Um, giving out ideas and doctrines and eventually laws mm. okay it's interesting as well that you know you mentioned that beast from the earth it, it looked like a lamb but it spoke like a dragon this image of the beast it, it's the image of the beast from the sea 
in the previous in chapter 13 that had seven heads and ten horns like the dragon in chapter 12 was described as having seven heads and ten horns so this is this one it doesn't look like the beast from the earth it doesn't look like the lamb it speaks like the dragon and it looks you know like the the first beast before him now the question is this image of the beast um when he is is given life and he's able to um go about what does he do what does the rest of that chapter describe him as doing what are all the the things that he brings about mandates mm -hmm. Yeah, what else? Or what else is added to those those mandates? Punishments for not going along with them. Hmm. Deadly um, punishments. Uh, it is interesting you mentioned that. What are the punishments? So it, it talks about wanting to get everyone to worship the image of the beast and to receive a mark. Now, what is the consequences for those who do not receive the mark? Death. False diets. <laughs> yep. Uh, I, I suppose that's a positive way to look at it, a forced diet. You can't buy or sell. Should be forced to cut back on the, the calories. But it, it's interesting in there, there are actually two, two consequences. It says there in verse um, 17, no one can buy or sell if they don't have the mark. But in verse 15, it talks about a, a death decree that they'd be killed. But notice that the, the death decree isn't for those who don't receive the mark, it's for those who don't worship the image of the beast. So that there are two things that it makes everyone worship the image of the beast and it makes everyone receive a mark. And if you don't receive the mark, you can't buy or sell. But if you don't worship, you'll be killed. And so it enforces two things and there are different punishments for those things. Now, for a long time, I didn't... Um, realize a difference between those and i just thought it was all just part of the same package and that the death decree was on on the mark but it's actually on the worshiping of the um the beast and i was was thinking about this and just wondering you know what is the what is the significance of that um and a couple of things that have been happening around the world have sort of made me understand the, the dynamics of the system. Now, none of the things I'm going to mention are the mark of the beast or are the image of the beast. But they simply describe how, or they, they describe the emerging systems that, that we see becoming more and more dominant in the culture and the world around us. The most recent one, and Ralph mentioned mandates, um, with the recent, you know, um, COVID-19 um, sort of pandemic that we've had around the world, um, in a lot of countries, there's been mandates on receiving a vaccination. Now, if you didn't receive a vaccination, you were banned... I know here you, you couldn't attend any you know council or government owned buildings. You couldn't go to you know libraries, certain shops, pools, council office buildings. Um, you could lose your job if you worked in certain sectors, and that's still in place now. So th there were all these um, financial penalties and, and segregation penalties for those that, that didn't re receive. The vaccination 
but there was also penalties for people who who did receive the vaccination but but spoke out um against the system for example um I, I you know heard and listened to several doctors or nursing starters that that themselves would receive had say that they've received the vaccination they've been double vaxxed but they would say something like you know that we, we need to actually look at the, the science behind this you know the the companies haven't released all the science it's not settled and they would find themselves being fired even though they had sort of received the vaccination they were not accepting the system that was pushing it and so they were still on that side being persecuted um if i give a, another example with the lgbtq aip plus community um you know that there's all this idea of you, you need to be accepting of people in, in that community but if you watch um certain people such as uh, uh one youtuber and influencer blair white who um is a, a trans woman but um they're a, they're a trans woman who believes that people should actually be informed of the consequences of the decisions before transitioning that you should be an, an adult before you actually make those decisions you know th things that are somewhat um you would seem to be a, a re responsible belief and even though she's a she is trans herself um blair white's been attacked by that a lot of people in that community for being transphobic for spreading hate okay e even though she is part of that community she doesn't in, in a sense worship the, the ideology that that community comes with um a, a similar thing with happening in the um black lives matter slash antifa movement um i remember watching an interview with this one gentleman who was uh african-american himself um and he's done more than anyone i've even heard about in in our times to actually combat against racism he personally um de-radicalized over 200 members of the kkk in america going around and visiting them talking to them um and and getting them to to leave their racist ideologies yet when he was at the speaking event because he believed in all coming together as sort of one country in, in, in unity and peace um, to sort of work out our differences. He was attacked by members of the Black Lives Matter and Antifa community for being a racist bigot. Um, and so in, in all these examples, like I said, none of these things are the mark of the beast, but all of these things sort of stand out to me as this um, growing culture in our society where there is sort of this, um, as Galen was talking about, this sort of philosophical idol, this ideology that a particular group will hold. And there'll be certain elements that the group will want people to comply with. Um, but even if, but, but there are two parts of it. There's complying with our requirements, and then there's actually worshiping our ideology. And they're trying to enforce both and so here we see this this image of the beast that will be this r religious idol in the last days there is both a worshiping of that image and a receiving of its mark you know it because let's say that you are one of the people that actually believe this mark okay well, whatever this this conformity is you receive it because you believe it's right but then you speak up and about individual conscience say it shouldn't be forced okay you would still find your head on the chopping block because you've refused to simply go along with this image you've spoken up against this idol and you're not completely worshiping it
Uh, Gaylene. So, um, there's an interesting word that shows up here um, several times. And sorry about that. Uh, um, you were saying, Gailene? No, it's all right. <laughs> um, I'm just, um, there's a word here that shows up several times, and it's an interesting one, and it's a little one, and it's the word or. Mm -hmm. You in the mark in their right hand to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead that no man might buy, um, buy, might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So it sounds like what you're describing just because someone complies doesn't mean to say they believe. Some people might believe and might not necessarily want to comply. I'm, 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 I'm I don't know, but that awe seems to have some significance somehow. And I, because mm, later on in Revelation, that awe is replaced with the word and for those that get the victory. It's the victory over the mark and the name of the beast and the number of his name. And it's all these ands. So I'm guessing that the or and later on the and is significant. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, indeed. Um and we might actually look at that now, you know, because um, it speaks about there in verse, sorry, verse 16. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And so the question we have is, is what does this represent? What does it mean? It, the, the right hand or the forehand. Um, if we look first at the hand, you know, it speaks about um, the right hand. What, what is the significance of that over the, the left hand? You know, why is it the right hand? And one of the things that makes that stand out is, well, most people are, right hand the, the right hand is your your strong hand um and that's the the symbol that's used at a in a number of places throughout the old testament that represents um your strength your your power to act okay um and we'll look at a, a few verses there's um when joseph's father blessed Ephraim and Manasseh, he put his right hand on the younger instead of the older. And then Joseph originally didn't like that. He said, no, 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 your right hand has to go on the older because that's where you're, you know, the, 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 the bigger, the stronger blessing will go. Um, but as far as I said, no, I know when he blessed Ephraim with the double blessing. Um, and that was symbolically shown where that's where his right hand went. That's where the strongest um, blessing was. Can somebody read for me um, Exodus 15 and verse 6? This is a line from the, the Song of Moses um, after God had delivered them from the Egyptians. Exodus 15 verse 6. Thy right hand o lord is become glorious in power thy right hand o lord hath dashed in pieces the enemy mm -hmm. and again in verse 12 it says thou stretchest out thy right hand 
the earth swallowed them. So the question is, what is the right hand symbolizing here? What is that? What is the significance of that? Hmm. Yep, power, power and judgment here in the in the comments. Mm. It's yeah, it's a symbol of God's power and, and judgment. You know, again, God, it's not a, a literally that God was doing this one handed with his other hand behind his back, and it was only his right hand that he was using. But the right hand is the symbol that is being talked about of God's power and ability to act. When he exercises his strength and his power, it's his right hand, his his action that is being carried out. And so the hand symbolizes, you know, your actions, your ability and your power to act, specifically the right hand is in, in, the, in this, your, your strength and power to act is in your right hand. Um, there's also an interesting verse in Deuteronomy 6. Now in Deuteronomy chapter 5, Moses has just repeated the Ten Commandments. And then in chapter 6, can somebody read um, chapter 6, verse 8, speaking about the, the words that Moses had just repeated to them, being the Ten Commandments? What does he tell them to do in Deuteronomy 6, verse 8? And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. Mm -hmm. And so again, there we see in your hands and your forehead, or you know, front of, between your eyes, it's saying that you know the the commandments of God are to be in your hands and in your your eyes. You looked at the hands being your actions, and and here it's where your your brain is. You know, if, if I tell some my my kids, you know, you need to use this. What am I telling them? You know, use your brain. It's about your thoughts and your actions in your your hand and your forehead. So jumping back to Revelation 13. The mark of the beast. So the, the, the mark of authority of the, the, which is the beast from the earth. Okay, that this image of the beast is pointing back to. So it's the, this, this mark of this papal power that is being enforced by this image is going to be received in the right hands or in the foreheads. So people are going to comply with it. You know, that they can comply in, in their actions, that they can believe it and follow along with it, or they can simply just comply because they don't want to go against the system. Okay, they just want to, you know, take the easy option and just go with the flow. And they're just going to receive it, not because they believe in it necessarily, but because they, they're not going to fight against the system. But something very interesting um, we see in Revelation, a lot of focus is on the mark of the beast. Um, but there's another um, mark in the book of revelation or a seal that is is received and just after here in uh, revelation 13 when we're taught about the mark of the beast being informed and all those that that worship the image of the beast can somebody read for me revelation 14 verse 1 and it tells us about an, another group of people and i looked and lo a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred and hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And so who is this other group? And what is the significant identifying mark that we're told about them? God's people and his seal. Hmm. 
Now, something interesting. Um, with this steel, um, in there in the King James, it mentions having his father's name written in their forehead. But um, if I'm going to read it from the ESV, it actually reads slightly different in other translations. In the ESV, it says, Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000, who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. So that's interesting. There, you've got um, in ESV, it mentions both the father and the son's name written in their foreheads. And if you go back looking at the, the, the Greek and the, the Byzantine majority text, which is where the text of Receptus um, was a part of, it actually has that written in the, the Greek as well. Um, so it seems that it does um, it does mention that the God's people, the seal of God, is the name of the father and son written on the foreheads of his people and so th there's a couple of interesting points there if the the, the righteous god's people the 144,000, if they're sealed with the the name of the father and son that the names of those they worship okay again that shows us that, that the sealing is a sign of worshiping the true god that would tell us that the mark is a sign of worshipping the, the, the false god, which goes along with the religious nature of everything we've been looking at here. But also, what's the significance that the 144,000 are only sealed on, on the forehead? There's not an option to just have it in the hand. You can't just get the seal of God in the hand. What do we think the significance of that is? Well, we're obviously not divided on the matter. All the yours in verse 13 show that they can think about it, but they still have to think to use their hand. Doesn't matter what you do with God's people, they can think about it, but they're still not going to go against what he says. Hmm. <coughs> <coughs> And yeah, like you know, with the mark of the beast, you can not believe in it, but still just follow it. You know, still still just go along with the system, you know, and just comply with it by works. But you can't do that with with God. You know, you can't um, simply have some, you know, self determining, you know willpower to just obey and, and resist the mark of the beast and just obey God and then that's fine God's going to look at you and say wow you, you, you were so good at your works you're getting the seal of God and coming into heaven you know you need to have that that faith that trust in God that belief in Christ as it carries on speaking about them following the lamb whithersoever he goes yes there they're obedient, they're faithful. But the seal of God is about worshipping the Father and Son in truth. Now, um, so looking at the, the, the mark of the beast, what we've seen about it here so far, the image of the beast and the mark, okay, it's religious in nature. Okay, but when we can contrast it with the seal of God, we see it's a sign of the God we worship. 
um, that scene as well and the fact that this image is, is an idol. It's about do we what God we worship. Okay. Um, it's got elements of both faith and action in the, in the hand and the forehead. It's based on the authority of the, the papal church because the image is, you know, making the, enforcing the mark of the first beast, the beast from the sea, the, the papal beast. And it's supported by Protestant America. Okay, this is the beast from the earth. And so we're looking for a, a, a religious um, sign of, of worship, of, of the God we worship, that comes from the papacy, but is also accepted by Protestantism in large. Now, before we look at that, I just want to look a little bit more about the, the seal of God um, that is contrasted with, and this should help us identify again what it is, because the mark of the beast is the sign that you are worshipping this papal system that is accepted by Protestantism and is going to be forced upon the world in worship. And the question is, does God have a sign that, that he has given to his people as a sign that we are worshipping the Father and Son, that we are worshipping the true God? Does he have this, this sign, this um, symbolical or metaphorical flag that shows our allegiance to him that we are on his side? Uh, Gaylene. I was just thinking... Um when we worship something someone whatever you know idea or whatever <coughs> we are um acknowledging that that for an example person that that person has authority over us Mm -hmm. whether whether it be you know um a sports person whether it be god whether it be the papal power or protestant america or whoever but when we worship we worship something someone um we 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 are giving of ourselves to that person so that that person has authority over us in in varying amounts um for some but yeah it, it's um yeah an authority figure mm -hmm. Can we turn to Ezekiel chapter 20? And so what we're looking for is what is God's flag that um, he has given to his people as the sign that we are worshipping him. I'm going to look at three verses here in Ezekiel chapter 20. Can somebody read for me verse 12 of Ezekiel 20 and then verse 20? So Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 12 and verse 20. Moreover, also I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between me and them that they may, might know that I am the Lord that sanctifieth them. And hallow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you, that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. So in both those verses, what is God's flag that he wants his people to rally under? It's a sign that we are worshipping him. Mm 
It's the Sabbath. Mm. Yep, God says, I've given my Sabbath to be the sign between me and them. The Sabbath is God's sign that we are worshipping him. And can somebody, um, I'm going to get to read verse 16, because the Sabbath isn't simply what we're doing on that day. Notice in verse 16, it says they polluted his Sabbath. They, they broke the Sabbath. Okay, they, they transgressed against that flag. They violated that sign. But the question is, according to verse 16, what did they do that was a breaking of the Sabbath? Ezekiel 20, verse 16. their heart went after the idols that they were um, cherishing in their hearts. Yeah, so it says, but they polluted my Sabbath for their hearts went after the idols. It doesn't say they broke my Sabbath because they went out and picked up to collect mana because they went out to do work because they didn't rest. It says they broke my Sabbath because they worshipped false gods. So again, the, the Sabbath is about worshipping the true God. And so we see here strongly that the Sabbath is God's sign that we are worshipping the true God. Um, if we jump back into Genesis, Genesis chapter 2, when the Sabbath was first given, we even see that here. Can someone read Genesis 2? Um verses two and three and while it's being read out i want people to take note of what is what are the things that are being repeated in these two verses specifically how many times is god referenced And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. So when God instituted the Sabbath there, what were the things he emphasized about that day? Gaylene. The seventh day. Mm -hmm. It was it was a specific day, not just any day that you would like to count. Mm -hmm. Yeah, three times quite specific um and the fact that he blessed it and he sanctified it mm -hmm. so that it specifically says the seventh day three times there you know god was very particularly with with what day it was that he was establishing as his holy day for his holy people um so before Seneva came in um, this was his holy day. But how many times is God referenced in those two verses? Either by, by title or just pronoun referring to him. How many times is God referenced? Ten. Ten times. So the Sabbath being at this, this sign 
um, you know, the seventh day is, is really important, you know, what that sign actually is. But what is the focus of the Sabbath? You know, God is referenced 10 times in that. The Sabbath is about the God we are worshipping. And as I said, you know, many times before, the Sabbath is not so is not about the day which God made holy. It's about the God who made that day holy. And so, again, jumping back into Revelation, we see that God has a sign for his people that we are worshipping the true God. And we see the mark of the beast, as we've looked, it's, it's a religious nature. It's a sign that they are worshipping. It's a sign of the God they worship in contrast to the sign that they, of the worship of the true God, which we've seen as being the Sabbath. It's a uh, um, the mark of the beast is this sign that's based on the, the papal authority, the authority of the beast from the sea, but it's also supported by a Protestant in America and the second beast from the earth. Um, and so the question is, is, is what do we have that matches all of this? Um, and on this, I want to share... Where have we got? I've got a catechism here that I'll just so I'll share my screen here. This is a doctrinal catechism um, of the Catholic Church. Uh, so you can hear it from, from their own words. Now, I had it here just a second. There we go. So as the, the catechism, it's a question and answer based um, way of teaching in the church. And so they ask the question and then they give their answer. Okay, so he, he, the question is, have you any other way of proving that the church had power to institute festivals or precept? The answer is, had she not such power, she could not have done that in which all modern religionists agree with her. She could not have substituted the observance of Sunday, the first day of the week, for the observance of Saturday, the seventh day, a change for which there is no scriptural authority. So this is the, the claim of that papal power, the claim of the Catholic Church. And there are, there are many examples where they make such a, a similar claim that as we saw there in the Bible, that God said the seventh day, okay, that the seventh day is the day that he declared holy. It's the day that points to him as being the true God that we worship. And their claim is that the papal church the catholic church had power and the authority to change god's day of worship from the sabbath to the sunday that that's that's the the, the sign here that is being used of their authority a sign that the power and the authority of the papacy is being accepted over what god said god said the seventh day the papacy says sunday the first day of the week and they're saying this is the this is the the sign this is the evidence the that we have the authority to change what God has said to institute our will. And it's interesting that this is a sign of you know the the papal power a, a, a power that comes from them, but it's also one that's accepted by the protestant churches which is another feature that we saw of this mark of the beast it's a mark of the papal power that's accepted by the protestant churches um and it's interesting i've got a a book here called rome's challenge um 
I don't know if many of you have read this, but it's a, a compilation of a number of articles that was published in the Catholic Mirror in September of 1893 in response to what was happening with the World Fair Day, um, or the World Fair, I should say, over in America. And, um, you know, the, the Catholic Mirror is a Catholic publication, and it's called Rome's Challenge. The, the subtitle is Why Do Protestants Keep Sunday? And it was a challenge that the Catholic Church was making to all Protestants saying that you have no reason whatsoever to keep um, Sunday from scriptures. As we read there in the catechism, there's no scriptural authority. And that argument, there's no scriptural authority. The, the fact that um, Protestants keep Sunday is a recognition of papal authority, that the Pope has the authority to change the law of God. And so we, when we look at here at this, this mark of the beast and we go through those, those features that it's described, it's religious in nature. It's a sign of the God we worship. And then, you know, it's the Sabbath Sunday is that it's throughout the scriptures that the Sabbath is a sign that we are worshiping in accordance with what God has said. The Catholic Church makes the boast that Sunday is a sign that the Protestants are worshiping in accordance with what the Pope has said. Okay, it has both element of, of faith and action. Okay, the keeping of, of Sabbath or Sunday, you know, it's a sign of the God we worship. It's a sign of the, the faith we have, but it's also an action that has a, a, a follow through on that. It's a physical day that we are keeping each week. It's based on papal authority, but it's supported and accepted by Protestant America and then Protestants around the world. And so we see that this Sabbath Sunday controversy actually fits every element that we have looked at here with the mark of the beast um, being enforced by this, this image. And we're going to look at, at 666 um, now. But it's just it's just interesting looking at that dynamics between Sabbath and Sunday. And as we mentioned, um, you know, the, this true Sabbath keeping, it's not just about the day. You know, you can't just receive the seal of God in your hand. It's about the heart of the Sabbath. And the heart of the Sabbath is a sign that we're worshipping the true God. That's why they have the name of the Father and Son written in their forehead. Because that is the sign of the, that, that, that is the, the true God, the Father and Son, who they are worshipping. Now, can somebody read for me uh, Revelation 13, verse 18? Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count to the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score and six. Hmm. Now this is a very six hundred sixty and six is this, the number, of the beast. Um, and in in pop culture and a lot of things I've seen throughout the years. This is like the, the, the one bit of this prophecy that they pull out and try to make an application. 666 is this, it's this, it's that. It's, it's a microchip, it's a barcode, it's, you know, um, CRISPR technology, whatever thing they, they try to apply it to. But what we need to do is what we've been going through here and doing and realize that this is, is one identifying feature of a whole bunch of things that the chapter speaks of. Going right back to chapter 13 when it identifies the beast coming up out of the sea. Okay, it's the mark of, of, of that beast. It's a number that belongs to that beast. Okay, that's being enforced upon the whole world. And so we've understand the, the context to which we're going to apply this. 
Now it tells us that this number 666 being the number of a man, um, the, the, the number of this beast power. Um, and it, there, there are two things um, that we're gonna look at when it comes to the number 666. The first is um, a title actually used by the, the Pope himself. You, you may have seen this before. One of the Pope's titles um, being used is the uh, Vicarious Billy Day. And a Latin title, it means Vicar of the Son of God. And when you put the, the name with the numerical value of the letters, as Latin was um, a language where the letters were also used as numbers. Um, you know, in, in English, we've got a, a separate, um, a separate number and letter system. So our, our letters and letters and our numbers are numbers. They're completely separate. But in Latin, it's not so. Um, all the, the letters were also used in Roman numerals to represent numbers. And when you take the, new met, the number value of the name, the, the literally the number of the name is 666. Now, there are an, an, a number of names you can do this with, but there, there's something um, I think is interesting about this name in particular. Uh, I am just going to pull this up here. Here we go. Um, I'll turn here to dictionary.com. Um, you know, it was Vicarious Philly Day. Vicar of the Son of God is the Latin. And if you ask the question, what does Vicarious mean? And we've got a, a definition here. Um, performed, exercised, received, or suffered in the place of another. Okay, a, a Vicarious punishment. You know, a punishment that is done in the place of another. Vicarious punishment. Taking the place of another person or thing, acting or serving as a substitute. Okay, this, this is what it means when it says vicarious Billy Day. The cure of the Son of God, it means one who is a substitute for the Son of God, one who stands in place of the Son of God. Um, and that in itself is quite a, a blasphemous claim. But there's something interesting. We're going to, in um, the Gospel of John, we find this verse here, when it speaks about the Antichrist. But who is a liar? So who is a liar, but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist, who denieth the Father and the Son. So it's speaking about this, this Antichrist that is denying the Father and the Son. Now, when we look up this, the word Antichrist and what that means, now, I bring up here the word antichrist there. Is, you know, it's two words, the, the Greek word meaning anti, and the word Christos meaning Christ. So it's, it's literally just two words, antichrist. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to take this word, uh, this Greek word, which is the strong number, is uh, G473. Um, and I'm going to search I'm going to see where, where else this word is used throughout the New Testament to, to get an understanding of what does the Greek word anti mean because in English um, anti is often used to mean against <coughs> You know, antibacterial or something that fights against that destroys bacteria. And so that the Antichrist is often painted in, in pop culture and in a, in a lot of different theologies as this uh, 
the absolute epitome of, of, of Egypt, the satanic force that is fighting against, that is trying to destroy the, the church, that this outside force is coming to try to destroy the church. But that's not the picture that is actually being painted. Now, the first time in the New Testament we see the word anti, which is right here, being used, um, is there in Matthew 2.22. And we read, but when he heard that Archaeus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there, the notwithstanding being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee. So this is, this is you know, they're, they're returning from Egypt, okay? Herod had died, but Archelaus was reigning in his stead, okay? Was, so Archelaus was reigning in the place of Herod. He was now the new king. And the word it uses is here in the room of is the word anti. Okay, it's not this new guy was reigning against Herod, was trying to fight against Herod and overthrow him. No, Herod had, had, had died. He was no longer king. And this new person was now ruling in his place. So here the word anti is actually being used to mean in the place of. This new guy was reigning in the place of the old guy. Um, similar here, an, an eye for an eye and a, a tooth for a tooth. The idea coming from that Old Testament justice, if, if you take my, my tooth, I'll take your tooth, you take out my, your eye, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. In place of my eye, I get to take your eye. In place of my tooth, I get to take your tooth. Um, it's used there um, when Jesus says to give them the, the temple tax, go get it out of the fish's mouth and pay it to them, give it to them for thee and me. And this is a, another way that the word um, anti is also used in, um, we find a couple of examples of this, this exchange that takes place. Like if you were buying something at a shop, you know, you had to go down and buy a box of batteries and you had money, you would exchange the, the money for the the item for the batteries i have the money of the batteries in place of the money i would take the batteries and so it's that exchange that in place of um and so it's there give it there for me and thee again here similar even as the son of man came not to be ministered unto but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many okay jesus came to give his life a ransom anti many did jesus die to condemn many to fight against many no he died in the place of many as our substitute and so again this is what the word anti is meaning here some some of these verses are have a very clear meaning of in the place of in the place of other times it's more um it carries more of a a, a, a metaphorical logical sense of this meaning but as we carry on, we see there again in Mark, that same verse, a ransom for many. Um, there's a couple of other ones here. Here in Luke. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, Will he, for a fish, give him a serpent? Again, will he, you know, anti a fish, give him a serpent? In the place of a fish, will he give him a serpent? And we can go through here and look at all these examples. And there are uh, many, many where anti is constantly being used to speak about in the place of. So when we read about antichrist, it's actually saying, one who is in the place of Christ. And as we looked in the, in the dictionary, the, the Latin word vicarious, for vicarious filly day, means in the place of. So if you were to take the word anti in the Greek and translate it into Latin, you would translate it into vicarious. So literally, antichrist 
as the one who stands in the place of Christ. The Pope's title, Vicarious Philly Days, as he's claiming, my title is I'm the one who's standing in the place of the Son of God. Um, and so that, the fact that the, that is, is a title used by the Pope that equals 666, that, that is this blasphemous title where the Pope is claiming, um, quite literally, to, to, to be, admitting to being the Antichrist, to standing in the place of Christ, the very thing that, that John warned us about. Okay, and here in, in Revelation as well, it's highlighting the number of his name would be 666. And we take this blasphemous title of the Pope and it equals 666. Now, one point, if you, you look up this vicarious Philly Day on the internet, you'll find um, a, a number of sources saying that this is a, a Protestant fabrication, that it was never a title used by the Pope. Um, because you know that they're trying to distance themselves um, from all this evidence that's come out. But I will again share my screen here. Now I don't know if you've heard of the the donation of Constantine. It was um, it, it was a, a forgery, but it was a forgery by the Catholic Church where that was used by a number of popes to show that they had the authority of, of Rome. There, there was a number of forgeries that were going around where, um, you know, the, the Pope or some kind of bishop needed something to be done. Um, and then a letter would appear on the altar of, you know, St. Peter's from from directly from heaven and it would say conveniently exactly what the pope needed it to say um and this is a, a forgery that was supposedly written by constantine um where he gave um the capital of rome to the bishop but interestingly um even though it is, is been shown to be a forgery, it was forged by the papacy. The papacy wrote this and it was used by the popes as being authoritative. And in it, this is, this is the English translation, but in it, it mentions about the papal authority. And it speaks here about, you know, as on earth, he being Peter, is seen to have been um, a constituted vicar of the son of God, so the pontiff who are the representatives of that same chief of the apostles should obtain from us and our empire the power of the of a supreme supremacy greater than the earthly clemency of our imperial uh, serenity um and so they were using this and the title that they applied to peter and to be inherited by the pontiffs was here, vicar of the son of God. And you see, he's got a footnote here, um, jumping down here of the actual Latin used for that sentence. And it is vicarious Philly day. So when the Catholic church produced a document of the, to try to convince the world of the authority they had, they called themselves vicarious Philly day. Also, there are a number of um, times where it's appeared in, in Catholic magazines. Our Sunday Visitor is one um, where it was actually appeared twice. And I've, I'm, I'm sorry, I couldn't find a better resolution um, of this article, but um, this is the best I could do. I, I'll read it out. I hope um, you can make it out at home. Um, the question is asked, what are the letters um, uh, appeared to be in the Pope's crown and what do they signify, if anything? And the answer that was answered in our Sunday Visitor is uh, the letters inscribed in the Pope's tiara are these. 
um, Vicarious Fili Dei, which is the Latin for Vicar of the Son of God. And he carries on to talk about the theology behind that. Um, now, it's, in it's interesting that this was published in Our Sunday Visitor. Um, and if you go to the archives, the these are all the, the editions they have. Um, it appeared in the November article of 1914 and in the April of 1915. Those are ones that can no longer be accessed. That, that, that entire um, year has been scrubbed from the catalog. Um, I remember looking at this a, a number of years back and you could still access all of these ones. It was only that one month and that one month where they didn't have any records that you could access online. Um, which I thought was conveniently suspicious and they must have as well. So now they've actually blocked out that whole year to make it not look so suspicious. But th there are a number of records out there um, that show that the Carius Philly Day was a title for, from the, the, the Catholics own sources showing that it was a title used by the Pope where the Pope claimed to be the Vicar of the Son of God. The, the, the anti-son of God, the, the, the anti-Christ. Now, there is one other thing that is interesting when we look at, at 666. Um, and that's it also appears in um, other religions. This is a, a Babylonian um, talisman, a um, magic number. And now this is a, a translation of what it is in English number so you can understand it. Um, but they arranged all these numbers from one to 36 in a square. So it's six by a six by six square. And they arrange them in such a way. So every row adds up to 111 um, and every column adds up to 111. So the, the, the totals of the whole thing is 666. Now this comes back to the, the astrology the, um, and the worship of the heavens. You know, there are, there are 12 um, zodiac signs, um, but they, well, the, the zodiac signs, it's the, the sign that, that's rising from the sky that um, lines up with the sun. But throughout the year, um, there are other stars that rise at that certain point, 36 in number, the, the zodiacs divided up further. And the sum total of all those powers, sorry, sorry, the sum total of all those numbers from, from one to 36 is 666. Um, and this comes from, from Babylon. Each star was its own God. And in, in their religion, the idea that all, all these gods, um, you know, shone their light upon the night sky. But when the sun came out, all the other night sky gods went away. So the, 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 the power of the sun was, you know, the, the, the total power of all the night sky. Um, and so one to 36 was all the stars that, that rose at the points throughout that zodiac. Um, so the sum total of all their numbers was the power of the sun. The 666 represented the power of the, the sun god. Now, something interesting about the Babylonian religion that we looked at earlier when we began these studies is when Babylon fell to the Persians, um, many of the Chaldeans um, suffered persecution um, for their, their religion by the, the new um, Zoroastrian uh, faith. And a lot of their priests fled to Pergamos um, where they took their, their their cultic religions and all this this sun worship, and 
the title of the high priest, if you remember, was Pontifus Maximus, was the high priest of the pagan sun god religion. That became the, as the, the king was often the high priest, um, as this religion took over Pergamos, that became the, the title of the king of Pergamos. When that was conquered by the Roman Empire, it became, Pontifus Maximus became the Roman Empress title. And when um, the papacy, again, rose to supremacy, that title was passed from the Roman Emperor to the Pope. So the same um, sun worshipping cult on, you know, Sunday being their holy day, was passed from Babylon through Pergamos into Rome and then to the papacy. So in these two ways, and that number 666 links Sunday worship through the authority of the Pope to the mark that they are enforcing that um, is accepted by all Christianity, bar a small remnant that have the seal of father and son in their forehead that are worshiping the true God and keeping the sign of his Sabbath.